Okay, let's go ahead and get started. I'm Charlie Smith, the executive director of eSync. I also serve in a leadership role with the Global Power System Transformation Consortium, or GPST, whose mission is to bring together key actors to catalyze a rapid clean energy transition at unprecedented scope and scale. This will be done by providing a coordinated and holistic approach to the necessary knowledge, education, and support to power system operators across the five action pillars. The foundation of the GPST is a group of six system operators from around the globe who are facing higher penetration of wind and solar inverter-based resources sooner than any other operators in the world. The five pillars of the consortium are research and peer learning, technical support, workforce development, technology adoption support, and open data and tools. More information on the GPST can be found at www.globalpst.org. ESIG serves as the lead of Pillar 1 and as such would like to welcome you to our monthly joint GPST Pillar 1 ESIG webinar series. This series is in addition to the regular ESIG monthly webinar series and will focus on the research agenda and research questions being addressed in Pillar 1. Topics will be presented by both the founding system operators and other advanced system operators active in Pillar 1 and members of industry and academia participating in the activities of the Research Agenda Group and the Research Advisory Committee of Pillar 1. An additional series of webinars on the other four pillars of the GPST is also being provided on a monthly basis through NREL. For those of you who would like to learn more about GPST and how to engage, please go to www.globalpst.org and click on the Get Involved tab. Further information on eSIG can be found at www.esig.energy. Next, I would like to go over a few logistical matters before we get started. First of all, phones will be muted for the duration of the webinar to avoid unnecessary distractions. For the Q&A, we're going to be using the Slido platform at slido.com. We will not be using WebEx for questions. You need to open a browser window, go to slido.com, and enter eSIG12 as the event code. The instructions are also at the bottom of this screen. You'll see a thumbs up button next to the questions on Slido to allow you to cast a vote to help prior prioritize the questions submitted. We plan to save 10 or 15 minutes for Q&A at the end and then wrap it up at the top of the hour. An email with a link will be provided once the video file has been posted. We also plan to provide short responses to unanswered questions after the webinar, so please don't be afraid to ask your questions through Slido. Okay, so today our webinar consists of a talk on what electricity grids need from inverter-based resources. Based on the number of registrations, this is shaping up to be our most popular webinar of all times. Our previous record was around 850 registrations, and it looks like we'll be around 950 today. The interest around the world in inverter-based resources is intense, particularly in grid-forming inverters. Today's webinar will feature a power electronics expert, Professor Tim Green of Imperial College in London. In his position at Imperial, Tim has a role in fostering interdisciplinary energy research across the university. His own research specialization is in power electronics for use in power systems. At the high power end, he is focused on HVDC transmission applications, while at the lower power distribution system end, his focus is on managing PV sources and contributing to voltage regulation. Tim has taken a leadership role in both Pillar 1 of GPST and on the research agenda, and in Pillar 3 on workforce development and education. Tim is a jolly good fellow of the IEEE, as well as a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering in the UK. I feel very fortunate to have Tim here with us today. We spend a lot of time on GPST telephone calls together. We've come to know each other pretty well during the past year, and it's a pleasure working with him. The webinar today will focus on the replacement of synchronous machines by inverter-based resources, which is fundamentally changing the dynamics and stability properties of the grid. The needs of a stable and secure grid will be reviewed in terms of voltage strength, frequency regulation, and synchronization. Tim will discuss how these needs are met by synchronous machines, grid-following converters, and grid-forming converters, among other things. 
Okay, just a short reminder once again to use Slido at slido.com with the event code of ESIG12 to ask your questions. And without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Tim, I'll now turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Charlie. Thank you for your warm words. Uh, thank you to the extraordinary number of people who have registered for this. It makes me uh, slightly nervous, I have to say. Um, I hope I do a good job for you and, and reward the uh, interest you've shown in the topic. Um, before I get started, I want to acknowledge that uh, my views that I'm about to share with you um, have been shaped by conversations with some very clever and able colleagues at Imperial College. I've listed some of the names here of my colleagues and my research team and some of the PhD students that, that I work with. So thanks to all of them. And thanks also to the um, many people in GPST and ESIG who've engaged in conversations on, on the, uh, the role of IBR within, within GRIDS. Um, I'm going to cover two things, and Charlie probably said pretty much this a moment ago, but uh, I'm going to say a bit about the changing um, definitions and thought services that electricity systems need in order to perform their, their vital service and how, that, how that's influenced by the rise of um, event-based resources. And I want to say a bit about the work we're doing at Imperial on some of the tools to help analyze and um, stability in, in IBR dominated networks and how to synthesize solutions to some of the problems that pop up. So that's my plan. Before getting too far into that, I thought it's worth rehearsing a couple of things, which probably you know, but I think they're worth rehearsing about inverter based resources and their relationship to variable renewable energy. The two things sometimes get conflated. They, they're related, but they're not the same, obviously. So we know IBR are becoming prevalent because of the presence of wind and solar and batteries as growing resources in our systems. And none of those are natural 50 or 60 hertz um, generators. So all require a state of power conversion to, to interface. And that's an inverter, basically. But inverters are there for other reasons. Um, regulated loads, so electric vehicle chargers or variable C drives are inverters um, as, they, as they face the grid. And we have lots of network equipment now, or growing amount of network equipment in the form of stack comms and HVDC terminals, which are inverters. We'll touch on some of the um, features as we go, but a couple of, to bring out at the front would be the IBR don't have a spinning mass directly connected to a generator on the network, so they don't have synchronized inertia. They have a current rating that's, that's unforgiving in the sense that the current rating you can expect to get for an hour is the current rating you also get for a second. Um, so you don't get a short-term rating. Um, and also an inverter inherently does nothing very useful until you wrap a high bandwidth control loop around it. And that adds some complexity to it. Um, and that complexity is also proprietary information. So it's rarely shared by the vendors exactly what that is. But the flip side of that, the benefit side of that is you can invert, make inverters do new things by redesigning the control loop. Just turning to variable renewable energy, so wind and solar, obviously weather uh, related and therefore variable. Of course, there are other renewables that are not anything like as variable, so geothermal and biomass and hydro. But the, the, they can sometimes be synchronous machine interface, but the variable renewable energy is almost always inverter interface, and that's why we tend to blur the distinction between the two terms. But some of the features we need to be careful about are really features of, of the energy source. And uh, because it's a fuel-free energy source, we will maximize the, the yield for each given weather condition. So we we'll run at a maximum power point. Um, and there's no point doing anything else. There's no fuel to save if we turn down, but we would lose revenue. It means we can turn down the power if that's a useful service and we're going to get paid for it, but we can't turn up the power unless we previously turned it down in order to be able to provide that service. So again, you'd need paying to do that. Again, there's a bit of a flip side. So, so that, that's not great that you don't naturally get a sort of a turn up capability, but what you do get is a, an, a resource that will stay connected right down to zero power throughput. So you could carry on providing services, at least non-energy services, even while not providing energy, you could keep your solar inverters connected all night if they were providing useful service. 
Okay, let's move on. So, I'll talk quite a bit about services in, in, on that last slide. We set out one of the working groups of GPST. Essentially, to define what are the services we should be asking vertebrate resources to provide to keep the system as a whole running appropriately. Um, and pretty soon we realized framing like that doesn't really lead you to a technology neutral set of definitions, which is what we're going to need as we transition between the old and the, and the new worlds. We want to bring forward the most cost effective resources. We don't want to hamper some of those resources by defining services inappropriately. So really what we need to do is to say, what is it that the system needs? And then how do we define a technology neutral set of services to meet that? So what does the system need at the top level? It, it's a requirement to maintain a reliable supply um, at a least cost. But that translates into some more detail as we start to think about the physical system underlying that, the grid and its all of its resources. We will have definitions of things we want to do with the frequency and the voltage and, and protect against faults and so forth. So define what the needs are in terms of those things and then look at the resources and say, well, how can they respond? What service could they provide back that helps the network or the system meet that need? And of course, that's related to the physical properties also. So this working group has started pulling that apart and then putting back together in a nice description. And we will shortly, meaning in the next month or two, publish um, our statement on system needs and, and services. And we're going to invite you to critique that and, and respond to it and, and help that move forward. At the top level, we have a set of broad categories. So first of those is around power quality and stability. So um, we want to be able to synchronize resources to the grid. We want the synchronization to stay good during things like phase jumps. So we want, those are our needs to, to synchronize resources and keep them synchronized. We need to keep the frequency at or close to a nominal value. We need to keep the voltage at or close to a nominal value. If, uh, if on occasion you can get poorly damp resonant modes developing, we need to pr provide damping for those. And we have a second broad group around service quality rather than power quality and security. So we need to provide the energy to the uh, customers. We need to provide capacity to meet peak demand. We need to protect against faults. We need to detect and locate faults. And we then need to do a restoration for customers who are off supply. And in the worst event, restart a system that's in complete blackout. All of that subject to a whole set of limitations from the physical system and, and, and from the IVR and VRE in particular. So limits on the way these things attain lock and synchronism, uh, the absence of mechanical inertia, the short term rating that I mentioned, but also things to do with that, with, with the wind and the, and, and the solar, the prime mover, as it were, the power and energy availability. So we're now drilling down in, in layers. And the next layer down would be, for instance, to take frequency regulation and start pulling that apart. So what do we mean? We mean we need to keep the frequency from drifting away from its nominal value. So in a in the event of a power imbalance, we have a need for something that can correct that power imbalance and stop a frequency drift. In the event of a large disturbance, a loss of power in feed, we want to contain the frequency perturbation within limits. We might want to um, limit the rate of change of frequency during that perturbation to stop other equipment, and particularly protection systems from malfunctioning and so on. Through a whole through through those five things for frequency, and then we've done that similar breakdown for each of those eight topic areas. And then each of those we've broken down further. We've got a description um, of why it's important that the need exists, or what's the consequence of it not being met, what it influences the scale of the need, and, and, and um, what are the physical limits on the availability of services to meet the need, and what tools would we use to analyze this situation and how ready is the IBR world to, to meet the need. I'm not going to go through these. There are um, eight broad topic areas. Each of has five or six of these. So you have a lot of these. They will be in the document. I picked this one by, by random, this particular one here, which is about um, 
synchronization about synchronizing talk and I was about to take it out because I thought it's actually not a very good one. And I thought actually it might be quite interesting to say this is one where we haven't yet really couched it in technology neutral terms. We've got this one which talks which is about synchronizing talk and is clearly directed at synchronous machines and another one directed at keeping phase lock loops stable. We haven't yet I think got to the bottom of how to cast this in a properly neutral fashion. So we have work to do. We may never quite get there and we may need your help when we publish the document to, to find better ways of doing that. We welcome that help. And when that situation, when that classification and set of descriptions is well advanced, we need to start thinking about where we get the services from to meet the needs and what resources can do this. So this isn't a finished article by any means, but just thinking about wind farms, um, they could provide voltage regulation services. They might be able to provide some frequency regulation services. Um, possibly that means you need to turn the wind farm down in normal operation to be able to upregulate on occasion. Um, you could provide damping services if there was an inter area oscillation, but you'd need some capacity reserved in the inverters to, to process the extra current. Um, on protection, Wind could play a role. It could provide fault current. Some wind farms sort of through grid codes do provide fault current, not quite in the same way and to the same extent as synchronous machines. So there we are constrained by the short term current limits of the inverter. But even things like restoration have been attempted. I've shown a dashed line for that because, because that's still under kind of special provision and, and, and exploration. But National Grid in the UK has started to look at doing restoration and restart from wind farms. And of course, we need to go on and do that for all of the types of resources. See, at the end of that, have we got a mapping from, to all of those needs from our resources? We don't need every resource to meet every need, but we do need to meet every need. I do want to note that there isn't a strict one-to-one -one mapping between a service that could be provided and a need. Um, some services, the provision of energy at short notice might meet more than one need. There might be a need that could be met by several different types of service. So as an example, we might think about sudden loss of power in feed. We, so two needs arise straight away. One is um, to contain the, the frequency deviation and the other is to control the rate of change of frequency or limit that. But they do overlap to an extent. If you start um, doing things to limit the rate of change of frequency. You're going to change the trajectory of the frequency and maybe um, it won't overshoot or undershoot as far. And you also buy time for other resources to come into play. And there could be several services. So, so the one we think of first is something like inertia, power proportional to rate of change of frequency. But increasingly we've got fast frequency response and inverters are particularly good at providing power quickly in a way that perhaps a governor regulated synchronous machine wouldn't. And also these things now called frequency containment. So not frequency power proportional to a frequency error, but power in a block that's triggered by a frequency error. And we could blend those in various ways. Okay. I want to move on and talk a bit about grid forming and grid following. I not really want to rehearse all of the arguments about exactly how they're defined, but I want to make some remarks. So on grid following, the first thing is that it's uh, controlled as a current source. We set up a current reference. We have a control loop that obliges the inverter to supply a current into the grid. And the, the other characterizing feature is how it synchronizes. It synchronizes by observing the grid voltage at the point of connection and using a phase lock loop to, to identify the frequency and phase angle. Whereas grid forming inverter, we, we supply a voltage reference and we oblige the inverter to follow that reference and give us a, a, a voltage behind an impedance, um, and then we synchronize it differently. So we have a, a droop function that defines a frequency, and that's the frequency the voltage source will produce. And then it will export power to the grid, and we observe that power. And if it's large, we might um, in, um, decrease the frequency and phase retard the converter, and it will export less, and vice versa. And through that feedback mechanism between power and frequency, the inverter will lock in and run at a, at a particular angle with respect to the grid. So, so those two synchronization methods sound quite different, 
just want to make the point that actually they're not as different as they first sound. So first we're looking at the phase lock loop. Uh, we're really trying to align the voltage to the D-axis. Uh, and if we see a voltage appearing on the Q-axis when we do our DQ transformation, we treat that as an error. And that, that's a phase detector effectively, and it corrects the frequency and therefore the angle until we get no voltage on the Q-axis. Whereas in the grid forming converter, we're looking at a power difference between the power and the nominal power. We use that to adjust the frequency and that in turn adjusts the angle. But actually, if you look back at the first one, if we are running at a constant current because we're a current source, then detecting the Q-axis voltage is really the same as detecting the reactive power. So this is like or similar to reactive power droop. And on the grid forming, we're measuring power into a constant voltage. We're really measuring the D-axis current and we're locking with the D-axis current. So they, they're different, but they're similar. That's the top line of this table. Different but similar in terms of, of synchronization. Markedly different in terms of being a voltage source or current source. Different also in the relationship really with the prime mover. Um, the grid following inverters are there to export power. Um, they export a constant power, but it's really a power defined by what's being put onto the DC bus by the solar panel or the wind turbine. Whereas for the grid forming converter, the power exported depends on the network it's exporting into its loads and its other sources. And so here the power follows what the uh, loads are doing and the prime mover must follow that to give you a power balance. Whereas in the other side, really the, the inverter is following the power of the original source and that's quite different. Um, this difference is also in the swing characteristic and that tracks back to the synchronization. The grid forming really, when, when you perturb them, you see the, the power swing or the angle swing against the power. And for the grid following, you're seeing the angle of the phase arc loop swing against the voltage. Um, okay, moving on. Talking about setting up a voltage source as a grid with the grid forming inverter, having it run at a particular frequency brings us into this debate about system strength, I think. And I, I like to break down system strength into frequency strength and, and voltage strength. And at the far end of that, the strongest system is the infinite bus. It's a constant voltage, constant frequency or angle. And at the weak end of that, you've got something that's a fixed PQ source. It doesn't matter how much the voltage sags or the frequency sags, it's still going to produce the same power and reactive power. So it doesn't aid the grid. And the grid forming and the grid following inverters live on a line between those two extremes, I think. Um, the grid forming is closest to the stiff end of that. So as the frequency drops, you'd see the source produce more power, whereas the grid following wouldn't. Um, but we've got other options. I've shown there a PV source. So something that runs at constant power and constant voltage you could set up a solar panel inverter to run in that mode. And for the grid forming, by adding a droop and changing the droop settings, you're softening that somewhat. But if you add droop settings to a grid following inverter, you start to stiffen it. So my point really is that there's a continuum between those two endpoints and grid following and grid forming stretch across that depending on how you set them up. Um, it's time to start to introduce the other bit of terminology, which is about around, um, uh, sorry, it's, it's around virtual synchronous machines. I don't want to say they're the same as grid forming. There are difference. I think virtual synchronous machine brings some additional features on top of grid forming, and that would be um, some inherent, so, so some synthetic or virtual inertia function, which a grid forming doesn't necessarily have and an ability to produce fault current. Um, okay. So when we think about this in terms of services, I, I don't tend to think of this in terms of, well, grid forming can do one thing and grid following can do a subset of that, maybe a lesser set, much more of a continuum between those two things. As there is between synchronous machines, um, 
synchronous machines with a governor or exciter are, are strong sources. They will support the frequency to frequency droops. We will get more power to bring the frequency back up. But quite a lot of our synchronous machines run with a dead band in their governor and in their exciter or, or AVR. In fact, they run pretty close to being PQ sources. So it's not that all synchronous machines are stiff sources in that sense. Some, some are not. Um, of course, a synchronous machine that's dead banded is a bit like a grid following inverter in terms of being a PQ source, but it's not like it in terms of it's got inertia, it's got fault current capability, and it is inherently a voltage source, not, not a current source. So I'm building this case that a number of different resources could be configured in different ways and, and bring forward a blend of different services. And the point really is that the system as a whole needs to have its needs met through a set of services, but it doesn't mean that every IBR has to come forward with the same combinations. And they very well may not because of their control loops or because of what it is that's supplying them power and energy. So we need to think about what we've got on our system. So this graph on the left hand side is one we'll due to publish shortly in a, in a white paper. Um, it's a result of, of using the investment optimizer that my colleague Goran Stravach has, has produced to look at what a net zero system in Great Britain would be like in probably 2035. Um, so you give it some cost assumptions, you give it some demand data and wind data and so forth, and it builds you a system. Um, and of course, it builds a slightly different system depending on your, your cost assumptions. But whatever we do within reason, for, for Great Britain, we end up with a large amount of wind, 100 gigawatts or so of offshore wind, and 140 gigawatts or so of battery energy storage, and some bits and pieces, some, some, a few nuclear plants still on the system, some gas turbines running on hydrogen to get us through some extreme events. But the point is, that combination needs to bring forward all the services to meet the needs. Well, some of those can come from wind turbines. Um, they, they can produce voltage control services, maybe not so easily if they're offshore. They can, they can provide a certain amount of the, 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 the fault current or protection system and maybe some of the restart. Maybe not so good on frequency regulation. But the point being when the wind turbines are producing a lot, the battery systems are charging or idling. And then we have the battery resources to give us some of the frequency response. So across the piece, we, we can probably meet all of those. I mean, a key question is, can we do that every hour of every day across the year? Are there particular combinations of events that would starve, off, starve us of certain services? And that's a very interesting piece of work to go and do, I think. And it's not just the temporal spread, it's, it, it's, it's the spatial spread. There may be regions of the network which are short of service. And that's why I raise this prospect of, of the role of statcoms and network equipment. So a statcom could produce the voltage response and the voltage regulation services we need, but maybe it can aid synchronization, maybe it can aid the protection system, maybe it could provide some frequency services if it had some storage. So one of the things we've we've looked at, this is the only time I'm going to get into the sort of the power electronic end of this debate in terms of circuits. We've been having a look at these multi-level circuits that are famous in, in, in HVDC now, but you can use them for stack comms. And one of the nice things is you can sit batteries on the DC links with some of the individual submodules. They're all running at around a circle of thousand volts. So you can see battery strings there. You don't have to put them on every submodule, just a subset, but they could give you damping services, frequency regulation services, and so forth. And something else we'd need to do, which we haven't quite figured out, is how you get this thing to provide substantial fault current on top of an ordinary load current. Problem for another day. Okay, um, I'm gonna move on, talk a bit about tools and services. There's another um, working group in GPST looking at um, tools to support an IBR dominated um, network. I'm not gonna go through that. I'm just gonna pick out a subset of things that, that, that we've been worrying about at Imperial. So the first thing I want to say is that with synchronous machines, very well established models, they scale well. If you know how a 10 megawatt machine works, you can figure out how a 100 megawatt machine works. They're scalable models. They're white box, you know, they're, they're well, they're 
the state space models, the equations are familiar, typical parameters are familiar. There's not a lot of IP wrapped up behind uh, um, closed doors there. We can do phasor simulation, we can do electromagnetic transient simulation, we can get the eigenvalues of our state space model to find unstable modes, we can use participation factors to find the root cause of the instabilities. There's lots of stuff going on. And we need all of that for the inverted world of the future. Difficulties are inverters don't scale quite as smoothly as synchronous machines. Just because you know how a 10 kilowatt inverter works doesn't mean you know how a 10 megawatt inverter works in terms of like a bandwidth and, and current limits and so forth. Because a lot of their features are wrapped up in control and the control is proprietary, then um, we tend to get black box models. So a manufacturer might give you a compiled version of the model, a binary code to run in your time domain simulation. You can do your simulation, but you don't can't see what's going on inside the wind turbine or the solar plant. Or they might give you a frequency spectrum, a frequency sweep across the uh, the range of interest and tell you the impedance at all those frequencies. It gives you some route into a stability analysis. So I want to walk through a couple of the stability tools and, and make some remarks about them. So first is state space, hugely powerful tool. Um, I mean, the difficulty is the computational burden in a way. It's, so it's much faster than doing time, lots of repet, repeated time domain simulations with slightly different setups. It's faster than that. But if you've got a 15th order synchronous machine model and you've got 100 of them in the network, you've got a 1500 order, uh, order system. So it's quite a number crunch. An inverter's likely got more states and they're smaller, so you've got more of them. So the system order is enormous. But perhaps more importantly, one of the problems of, of, of the inverter version of this is that the frequent, the, the time horizons over which various bits of dynamics play their role overlap. In a synchronous machine, if you're looking at a relatively fast event over a, you know, a second or two, you don't need to model the governor. It's never gonna move in that time, so forget about it. Whereas if you've got a slow event, yes, model the governor, but forget about the damper windings, they have no realistic impact. An inverter is not like that, all the various bits overlap. And if we wanted to separate off the slow bit and just concentrate on the slow bit, oops, I should have turned my laser pointer on by now. Uh, then we can't just ignore the faster parts of the system and not bother to model them or simplify them in the overlap region, they will interact. So what are we going to do at that? Well, we're going to truncate the fast bit rather than drop it and retain the dominant part of it for its interactions with the slow bits. So we'll partition the state space model. We will keep the slow part as it is, but in the fast part, we will identify the dominant dynamics, represent only those, and then add them back into the main model. So let me illustrate why that's a sensible thing to do. So here's a, a grid with a synchronous generator and a couple of grid forming converters. And it's got some swing modes. The two inverters can swing, will swing against each other in this, the way this one is configured. And together they will swing against the synchronous generator. So you can do a state space model. You can do the participation analysis. It tells you for that first swing mode between two and three, the variables or the states that most participate are the, the, the states which are the frequencies of the two uh, grid forming converters and their angles. But also it tells you that the currents in those current control loops also participate. Less, notice the scale shift, but are there. So if you dump that fast bit and don't include it in the model, they don't participate in that mode and you don't get its frequency and its damping right. And that's what we illustrate on the right-hand side. Uh, a pole map, the circles of the full model, the asterisk is the low frequency part on its own. And so most of those match up, but this mode here, the, the, the truncated model doesn't match the full model. But when we add back the dominant part of the fast dynamics, which interacts with the slow dynamics, we predict it correctly. And in this case, it's important because the real mode is in the right half plane is unstable and falsely finding it to be stable, of course, would be dangerous. What am I doing for time? Okay, what well, about 10 minutes? Should be okay. Um, what I'm about to describe 
started out as a, as a thinking about how you'd build composite models of inverter and synchronous machine grids. And it turned out to have some uses in, in terms of identifying problems. So a couple of quick remarks. When modeling synchronous machines, one of the key things is the mechanical dynamics. So how does the how do the torques acting on the inertias and together with the damping terms affect the speed? So it's a mechanical centric process. Of course, the torques, the electrical torques come from the currents, which come from interactions with the rest of the network. So it is about network machine interactions, but viewed from a mechanical perspective. Whereas with inverters, we naturally model them with voltage or current relationships for the control loops, loops. And they, you know, if, if the device is producing a voltage onto the network, a current flows as a consequence and that current is influenced by the network dynamics, but also by, by the inverter, that's the coupling. So they couple to their networks in different ways. You can write that out as a set of uh, state space equations or a set of transfer functions between all the possible combinations of variables. And we took that approach and then said, actually, what you can do is rather than setting this up as a set of inputs, some transfer functions to give you a set of outputs, you can pair a torque and a speed as a mechanical port and look at the transfer functions between them and have electrical ports as well. And when I say a transfer function between, say, torque and speed, it incorporates interactions with the electrical system because the torques depend on the currents. So we build these models with ports on them. You do that a lot in electrical circuit design analysis anyway. But the ports are not just electrical ports, they can be mechanical ports. So you, you, you model each item, an inverter or a machine with its various ports on a local reference frame. You then look at how that reference frame aligns with and synchronizes with the main grid and you have some synchronization or frame dynamics and then you can couple them. But you can then look into these ports and observe how the system is performing. So you can look at a V to I transfer function, so an admittance, or you can look at a torque to omega transfer function. And on this next diagram on the left hand side, we've got some of those for a particular test network Looking into the port, mechanical port on machine two, we see a resonance at nine hertz. Looking into the mechanical ports on machine one and six, we see a resonance at 3.3 hertz. That's an indication there's a swing between those two machines. How can you go forward from there? Well, you can start picking apart the model as seen from that port to understand how to influence the stability of that mode. Well, that would seem to tracks from torque to speed, so through in the mechanical part, which is the inertia, for instance, and then the torque constants, which wrap up the currents and how they're influenced by the rest of the network together with the speed. So that's a combination of things boiled down to a, to a pair of torque, um, torque coefficients, one which is a damping torque and one which is a synchronizing torque. And then you can explore how they change when you do things like in this case, it was changed the resistance of the of the line connecting the machine to the to the network. And that swings this vector around, which is the combination of the damping and synchronizing torque. And you can move it to be a stabilizing influence or a destabilizing influence. Okay. Moving swiftly on, I want to say something about impedance spectrum methods. Um, very popular in power electronics, um, brought to us by, by a chap called Middleton, who looked at stability in, in DC networks around telecom installations, 48 volt DC. And, and he told us back in the 1970s that if you look at the input of a switching regulator fed by a DC source and a filter, you can say the input voltage is the source voltage multiplied by one over one plus the output impedance of the filter and the input emittance of the source of, of the converter. And if that product of, of um, impedance and admittance um, encircles the minus one point, so this is a Nyquist-like criteria, this will be an unstable system. So, so the impedances and the admittances are not constant values, they're functions of frequency, they're quite complicated often. If they encircle minus one, it's unstable. Can you extend that to AC? Yes, some people have done that. Um, you can't really partition an AC grid between 
sources on the left and loads on the right, but you can partition it between equipment and nodes, be that load or generator, and, uh, and admittances of the network. So that's a partitioning we do. You can then assemble the admittance matrix of the network and the impedances at all the nodes for the equipment into an overall system admittance matrix. And that's a series of mappings or transfer functions between every node voltage and every injected current. The diagonals of that matrix tell you the relationship with the voltage of the node and the current of the node. And that is a useful thing to go and explore. And let me try and explain why. So first of all, sorry, one step back. Um, manufacturers don't want to divulge what you've got on the left, the full kind of detail of their control system. What they can do, though, is, is take each of these frequency dependent terms and produce an equivalent impedance according to some rules we've set out. You can combine those into networks and get an overall impedance for the system. And if a manufacturer was not quite comfortable with divulging all those individual terms, it still doesn't tell you how to reverse engineer a control loop, they could give you this as a set of data points against frequency, magnitude and angle against frequency. So that's what we're asking in the manufacturer to divulge. Um, how is that useful? Well, let's just start with what we would do ordinarily in a state space model with the parameters and the differential equations of the system with the state space model. We'd look at the A matrix and its eigenvalues would tell us all the modes of the system and we can look for those that are at troublesome frequencies or poorly damped. And then we can do something about that because we can decompose the matrix into the left and right eigenvectors. They give us the participation factors. The participation factors are lovely. They tell us to what extent a particular variable participates in a mode. So if you've got a poorly damped seven hertz mode in your system, you can go and find out that the thing that participates most is the AVR of the generator at bus 11. And then, you know, got some good clues on how to tune. So when you go through the impedance route, what can you do? So with the impedances of all the individual pieces of equipment, we can form the whole system emittance matrix. We look at the diagonal terms. We will either have them as, as uh, kind of polynomials in S, or we'll have them as a set of data points, but we can identify the modes and we can look for the unstable ones. We'll do that in a moment. I'll show you an example. But what about the other bit? Having found a mode that you don't like, how do you know what you should do to stabilize it? So the step that we're making is to say, if you take the residues uh, of these modes within these functions, it gives you something that we're calling the impedance participation factor. That tells you if you took a particular impedance and you increased it or decreased it in magnitude, would the mode move and if so in what direction? So it helps you understand that actually the impedance of the equipment at plus seven is the one that most influences that mode. That's quite useful, it at least tells you where to go and hunt. But if you can take the next step, say if you actually can then find out how a parameter, say like the droop setting, affects the impedance, then you can say how the droop setting affects the mode. Then you can do clever stuff. So we've taken uh, a modified New England, New York test system. We've assembled the impedance matrices of that. We've plotted them against frequency for several of the buses here. And you see you know, modes of the filter pop up. There were three modes here we didn't lock them, okay, labeled modes one, two, and three. I'm going to rush a bit, I'm afraid. We go through our methodology, which takes the black box and turns it a lighter shade of gray, if you like. We can then plot the three modes on the complex plane. There you are in red, blue, green. And on each one, we're plotting these vectors, which are these participation factors. If we look at the red mode at five hertz, if I want to stabilize it, I want to follow one of these two arrows. So that tells me either increasing uh, the AVR feedback gain at bus 11 or the inertia at bus 11 will stabilize. Whereas for this one up here, the, red, uh, the green one, if I increase the PLL bandwidth at bus 28 or 29, it will destabilize. And conversely, I could stabilize it by decreasing the bandwidth. And we can show that that works. This does identify the right tuning. 
Um, I'm pretty much out of time. I would love to sp have spent a bit of time on this slide talking about fault current, how to model it, and, and some thoughts about our impending need to start co-designing protection with, with current limitation processes and inverters. We've got some flexibility about how they current limit, not in terms of magnitude, we're never going to get big fault currents, but we can shape the fault current in terms of sequence sets and other things in order to help protection. We will never get it, I think, I don't think we're ever going to be able to use overcurrent protection next to an inverter, but we can make distance protection work in harmony with, with inverters. I've tried a few times to get work published in this area and, and fail to get people terribly interested, but we're having another go at it. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up. Um, so the first set of things I talked about were about services and needs, try to talk about um, the fact that not all devices on the network need to supply all the services, provided the systems needs are met, how we come to that through a collection of different resources is up to us, although we need a really good set of definitions of individual services, and we need ways of analyzing how they might be provided across space and time um, and in the right volumes. And I come to believe that part of that is is to not just rest on wind turbines and batteries, but start to think about what stack comms can do. And I've seen a lot of talk about synchronous compensators. That feels to me the old world. I want to try and make a stack com that can do much of what a synchronous compensator can do. Um, we'd really like your responses to the documents we're going to publish in, in, the, in a month or two, so keep your eyes up for those. And in the tools and models world, it's really about making sure that not only can we do a time domain simulation, which is lovely and indeed challenging with inverters, that helps us see what a, how a system behaves, but can we develop the tools that help us design it, that tell us what exactly needs fixing when we see a problem? Uh, can we turn black box models into gray box models and make them sing and dance the way that open source white box state space models do? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for paying attention through all of that. Sorry if it was a bit rushed. You should have seen the long version of this I shared with Charlie earlier today. But you will get the long version for download later. Um, okay, I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Tim. I have to say that uh, listening to the, to the, uh, the webinar or, or the lecture from the professor brought back memories of my days in college with uh, engineering and math classes. So. <laughs> yeah, good may not have been a good thing, Charlie. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, those were good days. Um, so let me go to the uh, the Slido. But before I do, let me just ask you to expand a little bit on the concept of inertia, Tim, because I noticed kind of interwoven throughout the Slido questions were questions about inertia and the difference the idea of inertia between a synchronous machine dominated system and an inverter dominated system and how do you measure it and when do you know whether you have enough or when you're running out of it so maybe if you could just yeah. offer a few thoughts about uh, inertia concepts yep. in synchronous and asynchronous systems yes indeed um so we know that in in the synchronous machine the inertia really is is as you decelerate the machine as you as you get a d omega by dt or df by dt, you get an extra provision of power into the, on, into the network. And what we want to do is, is mimic that in an inverter and then call that virtual or synthetic inertia. So at one level, what you need to do is, is measure the frequency, differentiate that, and then, and then change the power reference in, in proportion to that. And that is tricky. Because me to measure frequency accurately and quickly is a challenge. You can have one or the other, it's hard to have both, and then you need to differentiate it, and that's ideal. Um, so sometimes you don't actually do it that way. You by, by looking at the way you set up, the, just having a droop function gives you something akin to inertia, and, and you can find an equivalent inertia just for a droop-controlled inverter. So those equivalences matter help, you can get a sort of like an equivalent H or J coefficient for your um, droop controlled inverter. I think one of the things 
that was struggling with. So I've seen some nice studies where it's one by Strathclyde University looking at how much synchronous, virtual synchronous machine or grid forming inverted you need in a network to keep the frequency well regulated. It's tons of time domain simulations. I think the next step is the tool that says, I need this much juke coefficient or inertia coefficient in, in you know, 10% of my generators. That I think we have, we've still not got. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that. I know I have had uh, difficulty imagining inertia in an inertialist system too. So <laughs> I can identify with that. Here's the, the most popular question, Tim. Uh, at the top of the list, many people talk about grid forming having an inner current control loop and outer voltage control loop. But theoretically, this does not seem necessary. Can you comment? Um, yeah, it's, it's, so that feels so such a natural thing to do to a power electronics engineer. So maybe I need to explain why. Um, you could just control the voltage. So so you could measure the voltage at the output, feed it back, compare it with the reference. That affects the modulator, and, and off you go. And in principle, you can do that. The reason we don't do that, the reason what we want to do is say, if you want to change the voltage on the output capacitor, you need to inject current into it to shift the voltage. So we first define a current control function and then wrap a voltage control function around it. Is We like that explicit current reference because if we see the current going well above the current reference, that's an indication we've got a short circuit fault and we can put the, the limiter in and that's how we get the current limit in. And the current limit is essentially, if we don't limit the current under short circuit conditions, uh, the semiconductors go bang very quickly. So we like an inner current loop always. So the grid following inverter just has a current loop. The grid forming, we want the inner current loop to get the ability to do the current limiting. Okay, here's a, uh, a sensitively put question. Well, what, what do you say to folks who say things like grid forming is not necessary? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes and no. <laughs> it's what I say to that. Is, that. is that enough? Can I stop there? Um, we can't. People have run small microgrids with, with only. Uh, sort of defined the other way around that, that you, you inject powers uh, uh, according to the observed frequency rather than change the frequency according to the observed power. So you can play that either way around. So that you can do things that are not grid forming but are a bit like them. But I think in the end, you need a group of resources which together define the system voltage and system frequency. We can't, you know, the grid following in its sort of pure form says, I'm going to synchronize to the rest of the grid. Well, you know, then you get to last man standing sort of thing, don't you? What happens when the last of the synchronous generators goes away? What is it are you that you're going to synchronize to? So somewhere you need a relatively stiff voltage source that you can synchronize to. And just to follow up on that, Tim, I think one of the questions later on had to do with the uh, the need for a synchronous machine at all. I think the question was along the lines of what's the minimum amount of synchronous machine that you need on the system to keep it stable? And maybe you could address that from an inverter-based resource system yeah. point of view. So I think I think we're confident the answer to that is zero. You don't need any, uh, but you would need grid forming inverters as I, you know, that's what the other question was about. Because people have run microgrids you know, and lots of people, so we've done it in our lab, but we're far from the only, we, you know, we've got three inverters running together in grid forming or frequency droop mode, supplying a bunch of loads and we can switch loads on and off and the frequency rises and falls and self corrects. And there's no synchronous machine there. So the question is, how do you get it scaled up from a microgrid of the tens of kilowatts or even hundreds of kilowatts to, to gigawatt scale grids? So that would be a deep breath and <laughs> fingers crossed, but you know, in principle, no synchronous machines. In, in Great Britain, we're not going to get there. I don't think we, we, we're always going to have a couple of hydro stations and a couple of nuclear stations. We'll have a, but we'll have so few synchronous machines that we can't rest everything else on top of them. We're going to have to have grid forming as well. Yeah. Okay. Here's an interesting one. Can you share your thoughts 
on whether the positive sequence phaser simulation works for IBR dominated power systems? Um, yeah. I know you've thought a lot about that one. I think it's one of those where it will work for a for a set of problems which are you know or events which are slow enough. It won't capture, can't capture some of the fast events, and um, and therefore if you have a you know, if you have an event that that's fast in the real system and you and you're not capturing it in your simulation, your simulation is not giving you the the true answer. So and it may fail to. You, you would fail to spot some potential stabilities. Um, so anything in the super synchronous range or you know, what some people call harmonic instabilities are not going to get captured in that. On the other hand, if you were confident you'd flushed all the sort of super synchronous problems out of your system and you had nothing, no badly behaved dynamics above or close to 50, 60 hertz, then you could simulate the rest with a with a positive phase sequence or a, or a phaser simulation type model. And we have a lot of activity going on in, in that uh, that space today, I'm sure at Imperial as well as other places. Yeah, and, and the, the other working group led by Nick Miller is is spending a lot of time thinking about that and, and he would give you a really good answer on that question also. I just, I've just seen one question pop up, which was about could I provide any pointers to reports and things. So on a couple of the slides, I've put a link to a uh, a paper, a couple of those are in review. Um, what I didn't do and I should have done was was give some links for um, open access sites for some of those papers. So you know, if you don't have a university library, you can still get them. Let me try and do that, and let me see if we've got any of our papers under review on on a on a, a, a preprint service. So we can do that in the follow up. Then we can, uh, yep. in response to to that question, we can put in some of those links there. Yeah. Here's an interesting, interesting question, not quite in order, but how do we distinguish between what system needs today versus what is actually needed, supposing the whole system was based on IBR resources only in theory? Yeah. Um, I suppose the answer is we're, that's what we're trying to do, we're trying to, to look ahead and say, you know, so what we try to do is say, what, we're not going to define an inertia service. We're going to define a, a need for containing the frequency within a band, plus or minus half a hertz, whatever, and containing the rock off to better than half a hertz per second or something. That's what the need is. Now, inertia might solve that, but other things might solve it. So fast frequency response or things we've not even dreamed of. So the first thing is define what the real need is, trying to not express that in terms of how you'd implement it and particularly not you know in terms of how a synchronous machine does it um, we haven't taken that all the way to its logical conclusion and we've been tempted you know some people say well when the last synchronous machine is gone why do you worry about plus or minus half a hertz you know it could be plus or minus 10 hertz you know who cares anymore or in fact why why let it vary why not pin it exactly at 60 hertz and gps synchronize everything so that kind of far future version uh, it's, it's lovely to talk about when we're not positioned to write that one out, but the, the future, which is certainly IBR are dominant and 90, at least on occasions, 90% of the power comes out of an IBR. That's what we're trying to define for. Okay. Well, let's skip around a little more here, Tim. Um, could you please share your thoughts on how challenging it is to manage the reactive power for an IBR dominated grid? Um, yes. Okay. Um, so, so we see that happen, you know, we, we can do that in our microgrid. We, we have a, alongside the power frequency droop, there's a voltage reactive power droop. Um, it does take care to set those up so that you don't get large exchanges of reactive power between sources. So I think that's a space where it's about choosing those droop settings to, to get sensible sharing of reactive power between devices. And of course, you know, there may be some inverters which have little headroom for reactive power, depends how you've defined them. You know, so if a particular wind farm doesn't have much headroom, by the time it gets up to full power, it might be backing off reactive power. 
uh, then you have to supply from elsewhere, which is why I think sometimes you see a stack column at a wind farm. Um, so I think it's in those dispatch tools, actually. I do know how to dispatch the droop settings of all those inverters to get sufficient reactive power uh, and in, to give a well-managed system. Okay. When it's, uh, been working out there, risen to the top, I think I'll make this the last question because we're almost at the top of the hour. Uh, can droop inverters have zero power frequency droop coefficient during large disturbances to prevent frequency deviation in grid connected mode? Oh, that's good. I might need to think about it. So I wasn't quite sure which way around the zero work, whether that means you're trying to hold the power, hold the frequency constant, I guess, during the disturbance, perhaps is what that questioner is saying. Um, the bit of thinking we've done is, is a, sorry, I talked a lot about small signal stability, and I think large signal stability around inverters is really interesting. We, we've done some thinking, you know, what's the equivalent of the first swing? So you have a, you have a fault, a deep voltage dip, the synchronous machine over speeds because it can't export power, and then it has to regain synchronism and you want to make sure it's first swing stable and all the rest of it. Um, so what should an inverter during, during a fault where it, can no longer see the network because the fault has got essentially zero volts in front of it. Should it just hold a constant frequency and wait for the grid to come back up and then try to resynchronize to it? Um, or, or is it expecting to be accelerating during that time? It's not seeing if any power export, so it's going to accelerate in order to try to export. Um, that's a good question. I think that's something where, again, you know, we have got to come to a consensus opinion and the we is quite tricky because it's it's the people who understand the power electronics and the vendor perspective perhaps the people who understand the network perspective and both of them having to get a bit uncomfortable to understand each other's perspective yes that was a challenge okay um we're just a little bit past the top of the hour so i think we're going to need to wrap it up tim i want to thank you for a very informative and educational presentation i know i learned some new things today I had to reach back into the depths of my memory to remember some of those things. But I think everyone will find something to take away from it as well. As I mentioned earlier, an email will go out once the video file has been posted, and we'll get the answers to the unanswered questions posted as quickly as possible, including a few links to some uh, background material from Tim. We appreciate your engagement and would like to invite you to our next webinar featuring Open Networks, also from the UK on the topic of extracting flexibility from DER. This will be held next Monday, May 17 at 4 p.m. Eastern and everyone's welcome. Further information on all of our webinars and upcoming workshops can be found on our website at esig.energy under events and you're all invited to attend. Information on all the GPST webinars can also be found at globalpst.org. Tim, I wanna thank you again for this very timely and fascinating webinar and thank all of you for your interest. We look forward to seeing you again in the near future. And in the meantime, everyone, take care, stay safe, and thanks again for your participation. Bye now.